So like I said, we are dealing with husband and wife. Originally, they became a client July 16th, 2020, a couple months after the pandemic. They enlisted, they enrolled in the kingdom, okay? In my kingdom. This is a lifetime journey that I'm that this person is on with me. So I'm gonna be working with their finances till one of us passes away, that's the deal. That was the terms and agreements when they enrolled in my program, okay? Income, when they originally came to me, they were rocking at around $12,448.28. Expenses were $9,236.57. Total debt, $448,842.31. Cash flow, very nice, $3,211.43. This is July, 2020, okay? By September-ish, I believe, is when they obtained their very first debt tool, a home equity line of credit in the second position for $23,000, and they got an intro rate for 12 months at 2.49%. That was the intro rate. Fast forward, over a year later, income, as you notice, actually dropped down to $9,696.84. Expenses also dropped, debt was paid off, different things that they removed out of their uh, uh, lives to increase cash flow. 7,736.74, total debt removed from 448, now they're down to 406, 98886. Cash flow, nearly cut in half, 1960 with 10 cents, 1,960 dollars and 10 cents. This is where we are at as of September, 2021. They still have the same debt tool, Home equity line of credit in second position, 23,000. And the rate is now 3.25%. So it went up. They had an intro rate, like I said, for 12 months, 2.49%. That expired. Now they're at 3.25%. So this is the new borrowing cost that we have. They currently owe $12,618.78 on the HELOC itself, where we already did a chunk two months back from September. So a couple months back, already made a chunk. Now they're in the process of velocity banking, paying down the line of credit so that we can prepare ourselves to make that next chunk. Prior to meeting me, they were around 700 credit score. They've now risen to roughly 768. So they're doing good in that department. In addition to using their main debt tool, HELOC, they are also running bills through a credit card where they receive 2% cash back rewards. Based on the latest numbers that they given me, roughly 1,700, maybe as high as two grand, but this is the exact number that they gave me, $1,757.64 are bills that come from this 7,000 that can be paid with a credit card and they receive 2% cash back rewards. Like I said, this number is not totally accurate it was just what was on the spreadsheet it can vary it can go up maybe go down a little bit that's typically what happens eventually you get very good where you try to pretty much run almost anything and everything you can through credit cards to maximize on cash back rewards so they're sitting at two percent take that times it by two the number you're gonna get 35 dollars roughly on average is what they are getting back to offset our borrowing costs when we're doing velocity banking, okay? Here are all the debts that they have. They got a mortgage, 305,000 is the current balance. Mortgage payment, 2,220. Interest rate, 3.75%. We got three different credit cards. One of them is on 0% for the next six months. 2,204.53 is the balance. They're currently paying $375 a month that is not the minimum monthly payment that is what they're choosing to pay to have this zeroed out by before the uh thing expires credit card expires following card eight thousand nine forty seven seventy seven monthly payment 228 that is the minimum payment balance interest rates at 8.99 percent and the third credit card we owe ten thousand six seventy nine eleven two sixteen is the monthly payment 5.99 percent is the interest rate We've got a 401k loan for 35,000 bucks. Monthly payment, uh, I think she gets paid bi-weekly, so it's divided into two. But
but comes out to $323.33 a month. This comes out of the income, not the cash flow. Okay. So once this were to get removed, the income will actually go up along with the cash flow. I just want to make that clear. So 323, 5.25%. And then finally, a loan for $31,717.63. It's a personal loan. Monthly payment, $1,071.22. Interest rate, 15.43%. Now that we have gone through all the most important numbers and figures, I gave you the background story of the person, the client, and what their goals are. Here, we're going to go step by step in terms of us actually doing the concept. All the intricate parts that are in play, I can illustrate, illustrate it for you. Feel free to ask questions, whether it pertains to the topic or not. You're gonna wanna get your questions in early so that when I'm done, I go back, I scroll back up to the top and I will start reading your questions all the way through, all right? So here's what I'm gonna do to create room for error in my favor when it comes to the numbers. Like I said, we're in the month of September. I spoke to this client a few days ago. I am going to act as if we're in the month of October with the current balance owed of 12,618.78. And I'm gonna act like I'm receiving my income for that month, not including whatever cash flow remains for the month of September. So no matter what, these numbers are going to be inflated. So they're gonna be inaccurate to a degree because I'm creating room for error to say, look, worst case scenario by X and X date will be at this. This is when we should make our next chunk. Then what happens is the client goes and do that. They do the concept and they actually beat Denzel's numbers, builds up their confidence. They're moving even faster and they're getting greater results, builds momentum. Okay. So we're going to pretend like we're in October where we're going to get a new income of $9,696.84. And to explain, hey, Denzel, what the heck happened? They went from 12 down to 96. What happened was husband um, either left his career. I don't think he got fired. Maybe he was let go of the pandemic. I'm not sure, but husband was out of work for quite a period of time. And he's just now getting back into the rhythm of working. So we can expect, she expects that his income is actually going to rise while doing velocity banking, which is also going to create room for error in her favor where we're going to go faster. Again, I'm using these numbers where they're currently at and projecting maybe the next year looking forward. But I can assure you that between husband and wife, these people, they've got good careers. Um, wife, is a software developer, husband is a business analyst. So they've got solid careers. He had made a transition there, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they, they are investing in real estate or will be, that is one of their goals. So they're looking pretty good. <clears throat> also, on the other hand, in terms of like background numbers, you know, yes, they do have savings. They've got some investments. We're strictly looking at four major numbers and not pulling from anywhere else to accelerate the concept. We've already, maximized in terms of their uh, the way that they live the way they operate we're not being too minimalistic on that approach they're operating within their means producing positive cash flow and just maximizing every dollar so i want to lay that out as well okay so let's take a look we're in october let's just say income comes in lands where in the checking account where is that checking account when i'm doing velocity banking ideally that checking account i want it at the same bank where I have my debt tool. So where they got their home equity line of credit, second position, checking account linked to the HELOC. Denzel, what does linked mean? I hear you say that all the time. Just simply means that they're at the same location. They're at the same bank and I can make very convenient, easy transfers to and from the accounts. I log onto the mobile app. I can see my HELOC. I can see my savings account. I can see my, che my checking account. I can make an easy transfer, yada, yada. There's nothing to it, okay? Don't get hooked up on the terminology. Just understand the principles and the rules that go with it, okay? So they've got their checking account at the same bank. Money comes in, where does it go? The minute money hits my checking account, where does it go? I make a direct transfers is a word, payment to the HELOC. I have 
couple of different options when we're playing around with home equity lines of credit. We can make principal only payments. We can make interest only payments. We can make principal plus interest payment. In this particular case, we're dealing with a HELOC that is principal and interest payment. So what that means is I owe 12,618.78. If I make a payment on October 1st, okay, and I owed 12,618.78 for say seven days, okay, let's do the math together. Let's say for seven days, you owed $12,618.78 on the HELOC for seven days. Take that number, balance owed, times it by what? 3.25%. You get $410. That's the amount of interest that I'll pay over 12 months, over 12 months. Okay. So we take the number, divide by 365. I'm paying roughly a dollar and 12 cents per day for however long I owe 12,618.78. Take the 112 times it by seven days. I will owe on October 1st, if I made a payment on October 1st, I'm going to make a lump sum payment of the income that landed in my checking account. I move it to the HELOC. I pay what? I pay $7 roughly and 86 cents in interest. The rest all principal, okay? Peanuts, small. The interest compounds daily based off the balance owed, okay? Every time the balance goes up, goes down, the interest gets recalculated based on the balance owed from day to day. When we say simple interest daily compounded, that can mean two different things sometimes. Majority of the times of, of all the situations I've been in so far with dealing with clients that have HELOCs, it is charged daily, but the number that I'm getting charged does not compound on the number itself. It just simply adds, 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 adds. Okay. So let's, let's break that down. So you truly understand what I'm getting at and what to avoid. Okay. So if I said, that we're getting charged a dollar and 12 cents for however long I owe 12, 6, 1, 8, 78. On Monday, boom, I pay 112. On Tuesday, I pay 112. On Wednesday, pay 112. Thursday, pay 112. That number does not change. Technically speaking, this is compounding because by the time you make the payment, you add it all up, that's what you pay in interest. Another version of compounding occurs with your credit cards. This is why credit card debt can become very difficult to pay off when you're just making extra payments over a period of time or just regular payments for that matter. I can't tell you how many clients I deal with that just pay monthly minimum payments on their credit cards and they don't realize that they're getting eaten up alive, which is why it'll say, hey, it'll take you 16 years to pay this off, 12 years to pay this off if you just pay the monthly minimum payment on the credit card itself, okay? So unlike a credit card, when I get charged interest, they're charging me daily compounded interest. Let's say it was the same number I owed on a credit card, 12,618.78. Today, I'll owe $1.12. Here's what they do. They take that 112, they add it to the 12,618.78 times 3.25%. Okay, the number goes up ever so slightly. Okay, so the next day, now you owe $1.13. The next day, $1.15. The next day, $1.17. This is daily interest compound. Same terminology. This is where it gets confusing sometimes. But this occurs with your credit cards typically, not with your HELOC or your PLOC or your all in one loan or your high cash value life insurance policy. Not the case. It's just simple interest daily compounding for this way. This way, we don't want. So this is why I'm very careful with people that wanna be doing velocity banking with credit cards. The way you get around this, here's where credit cards becomes lovely, is you don't actually get charged this 
on a daily basis. You get charged this on the what? The due date, okay? This is where these two, when married together, HELOC, credit card, PLOC, credit card, high cash value life insurance, credit card, all in one loan, credit card. When you marry them together, uh-oh, we get to do some serious damage. So if I owe money on a credit card, I'm not getting charged interest until the due date. That's usually roughly 25 days after you initially enroll the card, 25, roughly 30 days, right? Runs on a cycle. So as long as I pay the balance before the due date in full, I get charged zero, zero, zilch, nada, zero interest. With a home equity line of credit, with a PLOC, no matter what, whether you paid it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, so no matter what day you pay it, however long you owed money, you're gonna pay interest, okay? That's how they charge us. So what we're doing in the velocity banking world, is we're taking advantage of both. We're figuring out a debt that I can consolidate, move, transfer from higher rates to a lower rate. And then on top of that, to offset the cost of this, we take bills that can be paid with a credit card, bam, we run it through the card for those 30 days, get charged nothing in interest, we're getting cash back rewards, we're being incentivized, we're getting a thank you from the credit institution because they make money when we do not pay the bill on time, they get, right, they make a profit for the interest, but they also make money when you use the card because the business that you swipe the card at charges a merchant processing fee, okay? So the fees get, are from the business owner, you as the customer are being incentivized to use their card. So those institutions are making money in multiple different ways. What we're simply doing is taking advantage of the incentive and putting it in our favor, got it? So while we owe money on the HELOC, we know we're gonna pay interest on that there is going to be some borrowing costs. Our goal is to offset that. We use the card, get those 2%, roughly 35 bucks. That 35 bucks is gonna offset whatever my borrowing cost is on the what? The HELOC. In addition, whatever the heck I moved onto the HELOC is also going to save me money on interest of whatever debt I knocked out that I completely got rid of, plus that payment that I was making to that other institution I'm now making back to my home, the equity in my home, paying myself back. Brings my borrowing costs to nada, to zilch, zero, okay? How you feeling so far? You guys liking this? Drop a comment below. Let me know you're with me. If I lost you, if you like Denzel, you lost me. Repeat that. Say it again, okay? Let me know. Got uh, KJ still listening, learning from you, okay? First time, cool. Cool, cool, I don't see any activity in the chat room. All right, you guys are focused, you're taking notes. That's what I like to see. So now, let's run some numbers. If I owe 12,618, you already determined that per day was a dollar and 12 cents. Let's do 12,618.78. And let's minus income, 9696.84. Brings it down to 2,921.94. The balance on my HELOC, would go as low as down to that point over a period of 30 days. It may not ever hit that technically because by the time you put money in, what's happening? Money's coming out to do what? To pay bills. So that may not happen. All we're doing is trying to get a range, determine what that average cost is likely to be, likely to be, okay? So 2,092194 times that by 3.25%, boom, divide by 365, bomb. 26 cents a day for however long I owe on that amount. Okay, great, okay. So we did, we know what our original balance was. We know what the lowest balance can be in the month. And then we add expenses, 7,736.74. The balance should round out somewhere around $10,658.68. Times that by 3.25%. Divide by 365, 0.94, okay? We've got three distinct numbers. Highest balance, lowest balance, ending balance. These are the three numbers that you'll do 
on your own velocity banking situation from month to month to determine what my borrowing cost will be before I make the chunk so we can measure, does this make sense or is it better for me to do debt snowball? Remember, we're always using debt snowball, maybe even debt avalanche as our measuring stick to determine whether or not velocity banking works in our favor. Highest balance, lowest balance, ending balance. Add the three, divide by three. Add the three, divide by three. My average cost of borrowing per day, roughly 77 cents. Times that by 30 days, $23.29. Not bad at all, so I made a mistake. $23.29 is my borrowing cost when using Velocity Banking on a HELOC in combination with a credit card. $23.29. Now, what also happened in that month of October, right? We made $35.15 in cashback rewards. So what is my borrowing cost, ladies and gentlemen? $35.15 minus $23.29. $11.86 positivo, positivo, oye, mira, pay attention. What's my borrowing cost? Zero, nada, zilch, nothing, numero zero, done. This is the best case scenario when you're doing velocity banking is your borrowing cost is nothing, zero. You actually come out ahead. Beautiful position to be in. So therefore, if my borrowing cost is zero, and the goal is to pay off debt, and your measurement stick is debt snowball, we know that any other method you apply to this, minimalism, get a side gig, side hustle, sell your stuff, be frugal, cut back. These are all external things to enhance your debt payoff timeline. Would you agree with that? Those are all external. Regardless of the main concept, those are external that adjust these numbers, not the debt numbers. They adjust the four major numbers. We can all agree with that. So put all of the external ways to, to pay down debt faster and just focus on the numbers at play and the debts. If I were to do debt snowball, making extra payments of 1,960.10 towards my smallest debt, which would be what? The 2,204.53. That's according to debt snowball. Why on earth would I do that if I'm getting charged 0%? For the next six months okay that's a dilemma number one for me so right away if you were to do debt snowball with the same exact numbers as me following the baby step rules following debt snowball rules smallest to highest debt you have to pay this first the 2204.53 right you have to pay that if you're doing debt snowball i'm paying a debt that is charging me interest therefore i go faster than you this is where debt avalanche comes into play. Okay, debt avalanche says highest interest debt first. What is that on the board right here? 15.43% payments a thousand bucks. We owe 31,000. So I take the 1960.10 and for the next X amount of months, I'm gonna pay an extra 1900 towards this $31,000 debt. That's what debt avalanche says to do. What's the problem with that? Well, it's not really a problem. It's going to get results. Whether you do snowball, avalanche, velocity banking. Question is, which one is more efficient? Efficient doesn't always necessarily mean that I'm going to pay it off faster. Doesn't always necessarily mean that. But in my eyes, efficiency means fastest in my eyes. But I can understand how this can be very confusing to an individual. So therefore, what happens to velocity banking? If this stuff flies over your head, if you just can't get it, no matter how many times I watch Denzel's videos, it's just too confusing. This is no longer efficient. So therefore you would want to do a snowball. That means you don't, you close your eyes to interest rates, you close your eyes to cash flow, you close your eyes to income opportunity, you close your eyes to everything, and all you focus on is the smallest debt, and you work your way up and you create momentum that might be efficient for some people right but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna go what faster than if we were just judging the numbers 
But when you add the human factor of an individual that's undisciplined, does not have a good track record of saving, has been in debt all their lives, mom and dad was in debt all their lives, grandma and grandpa was in debt all their lives, they got a whole generate, multiple generations of debt. That's all they know is debt and borrowing. All they know is being a debtor, not a lender, right? All they know is being in debt, the borrower, but they know nothing of being lender. They know nothing of that language. Well, then this would be inefficient. They would not go as fast, no matter how good the numbers show. They would not go that fast. They would fail. Why? They don't have the culture yet. Maybe the culture of the kingdom. Maybe the culture of good money saving habits. Maybe the culture of increasing income. Maybe the culture of crisis versus opportunity. Did you know that the word crisis to the Chinese means opportunity versus Americans? When you look at the news, it says crisis, 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 crisis. To us, that means danger, 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 danger. Go away, go away. It's all bad, it's all bad. Danger, danger. Go away, it's all bad. That's how Americans view crisis. The Chinese people, crisis, opportunity, 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 opportunity. Uh-oh, it's a different culture. So you have to understand who you're dealing with for my financial coaches watching, consultants, people that are looking to implement velocity banking in your practice. Sometimes you gotta put the numbers aside and really identify who am I looking at right now? What culture does my client have? What is their track record when it comes to money? Have they saved consistently? Have they invested consistently? Have they paid their tithes, give consistently? Do they just give consistently to an organization, to a business? Like what have they done consistently with their finances that have created some sort of success? And we measure that. You say, okay, well, based on that, I like what you're doing there, Sue. I like what you're doing there, Tom, Joe, Mary. I like it, I like it. Here, we're gonna implement this concept right here that can potentially produce some results, okay? So I need to give you guys that, that other feedback there, that other important information. Take away the human factor, take away the person here on the board. Take away the emotion, take away your feelings, and just look at the numbers. You could say, well, if my borrowing cost is zero, and I actually make money on the process of paying off debt, then no matter what, Velocity Banking goes faster for this period of time, in this very moment. Velocity Banking goes faster than Debt Snowball, Debt Avalanche. If we get the okay green light on that, we say, yep, let's keep it going. Let's continue to do Velocity Banking. So with that being said, your most expensive month of borrowing costs when you're doing Velocity Banking it is the month that you make your first chunk, which is the month that you chunking, meaning take money out of the line of credit. So this couple here, they chunked two months prior to September, right? Two, three months prior. So that means their most expensive month has already passed. They're roughly three, maybe four months in, if that. Now they're at 23, 29. They're gonna pay that interest, right? They're paying that, but they made 35. So they net 11, 86. This, this whole 35 total can go into the expenses to, re to bring the credit card that they ran up a balance back to zero that much faster. What does that also do, ladies and gentlemen, if I go that route? That means less money has to come out of the line of credit when I pay bills. So the longer I keep my 9,696.84 in the HELOC, the lower my borrowing costs goes. If I'm running a lot of bills through the credit card, and on top of that, I reroute the cashback rewards to pay the card off by $35.15, then only $1,720 needs to come out of the line of credit to pay that bill. And I only pull it out when? On the due date of the card, or say, to be safe, the day before. Right. So now you're wondering, well, Denzel, how does it work once we dump all our income in? How much money do we know or should we be pulling out? Uh, should we be pulling money out every day, every week? What's the most efficient way to do that? Well, there's a couple of ways, depending on the type of debt tool that you have. So just specifically looking at this specific home equity line of credit with no withdrawal limits, no transaction limits. I can take as much out as I want. I can put as much as I want inside, no limitation. Now that we understand that, best time, or I should say most effective way 
to pull money out of the HELOC throughout the month to pay your bills is either going to be a daily, that's like truly maximizing it, more efficiently, in my opinion, three to five days. Every three to five days, money would come out of the HELOC to cover bills and expenses that cannot be paid with a credit card, right? So all of these monthly payments cannot be paid with a credit card. The 2000, 375, 228, 216, 323, 1000 bucks cannot be paid with a credit card, okay? So the bills that cannot be paid with a credit card every three to five days, I pull out a lump sum of cash back to what? The checking account that was linked to the HELOC. Your checking account continues to pay bills just like you were doing before. The rest of your income sits there in the HELOC, covers the payment of the HELOC itself. So therefore, there's no payment on the HELOC. This 12,618.78, there's no payment. My payment was my paycheck. When I make the payment to, to the HELOC via my paycheck, damn near all of that is what? Principal, very little interest. Again, offsetting the interest. Hope I'm being very laser focused here this evening because I think a lot of people are getting confused. And as you should be, because this isn't a culture most of us are used to. So you will be confused. And then there's a lot of content in the marketplace, which can be very difficult to comprehend when you're learning from five, 10 different people. So while you're doing your research, be sure to eventually narrow your viewership to a few people, maybe five or less. Narrow it down so you can get honed in on a few ideas that you can implement to renew your culture, your way of thinking around money to better your situation, right? So let's keep this going. We understand what's going on fully. I'm doing velocity banking on the HELOC. I'm running bills through a credit card. I'm getting cash back rewards. My cost of borrowing is zero. I actually come out ahead. I'm making money while paying off debt. Another thing that we can do to enhance the strategy here is we can come back to this card right here, this credit card, and we can say, okay, what's the culture with this? I see a lot of people doing this when I work with clients. They, they take the balance that's owed when they leverage a credit card on 0%. They take the balance and they divide it by the amount of months that they have zero interest, which is a noble strategy. It prevents what from occurring? It prevents you from forgetting to actually pay that bill off in time. So if you're that type of person that kind of forgets, you're like, oh shoot, I got that credit card expiring next month. These credit card companies aren't exactly notifying you when your card expires. That's part of the game that they're playing. They're betting that you're gonna forget because they gave you such a long time, 12 months, 18 months, 21 months, 24 months, 30 months, or however long it goes. They do that on purpose so you forget. Meanwhile, the interest is compounding daily, stacking, 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 stacking. Moment you forget, they now get to charge all that interest to your original balance that was damn near paid off, but you let it slip. So I can totally understand when people do this and they take the balance they owed on a 0% card, they divide it by the amount of months that they have zero interest. So in her case, roughly 375 a month is what she's paying for the next six months. Now, I told her, now that you're disciplined, husband and wife, very good with cash flow. You've paid off a ton of debt. You've been doing velocity banking for a year. Let's drop that method and let's practice efficiency with every dollar. Let's maximize our cash flow. Instead of paying 375 a month, you're just going to pay the monthly minimum payment of that card, which is probably anywhere from roughly one to 2% of the balance. So it's probably going to be like 50 bucks a month, probably less than that right? Let's call it 50. 375 minus 50 is 325. I can reroute $325 back to the cash flow, ladies and gentlemen. What occurs when I do that? Well, 7,736.74 minus 325. My expenses now drop to 7,411.74. Cash flow increases by the same amount of number, 196010 plus 325. Now I'm at 2,285, 10 cents. Uh-oh, 
We're not, we didn't even pay off debt yet. All we did was reroute to cash flow. Why? It doesn't cost me anything to keep this debt. In the velocity banking world, we're constantly looking for cash flow opportunity increases plus interest savings. Usually cash flow is critical, interest savings second, balance third. So usually that's the order. Cash flow first, interest savings second, balance of the debt third. In that order is typically the case, majority of the time. $325 of principal on a debt that is charging me interest, what happens ladies and gentlemen? I go faster, I go faster. The dollars work harder for me. So now I only have 7,000 for 1174 coming out, 2,285 stays in the HELOC. Again, I'm leaving room for error. So I went off of these numbers till about January of 2021. Income goes in, expenses come out, balance is at what? 86, 98, 58. December, income goes in, expenses come out. Bomb, 6,738.48. January, balance is at roughly 4,778.38. If you were to take 325 times it by four months, right? 325 times four is 1,300. So you could take 4,700 minus 1,300. The actual balance should be probably somewhere around $3,400. And then when you factor in the likelihood of their income returning back to this number over a period of time, Let's just say it goes up a thousand bucks. Let's just say it goes up 500 bucks. 500 times four is two grand. Balance is nearly paid off. So I'm betting that anywhere between January and February of 2022 is when I make my next chunk, all right? Next chunk. The balance should be paid off, zeroed out. If it's not zeroed out, it's very close to zero. Here is a situation where we don't necessarily have to wait for the HELOC to hit zero before making our next chunk payment. Why Denzel? Because since October, September of 2021, this tool, this debt wasn't charging me any interest, although I owe money on it, although I'm paying interest, I'm offsetting it, ladies and gentlemen. So therefore I'm incentivized to leverage this debt zero costs, borrowing from Peter to pay the Pauls, to pay the Pauls. Pauls charged me 8.99, 5.99, 5.25, 15.43. Do you see that? Good stuff. Based off the numbers right here, we're not even going to factor in that we're making monthly payments on these debts. Okay. So that means come January, February of 2022, all of these debts are going to be lower. You agree, right? The mortgage, everything's going to be lower. We're not even gonna factor that in, we're just gonna look at what would be the next most ideal debt to tackle. I want you to think about that for a second and comment. My HELOC's at zero, 3.25%. We know what our rule is, right? We take the balance of the 23,000 times that by 66%, that's $15,180, okay? For my seasoned subscribers, Kingdom citizens, clients, loyal subscribers, I want you to comment your thoughts. What is my next move? What are some things that I can potentially do to enhance this strategy for this client right here? We know the rule, next chunk, 66%, we get it, 15,180. But I want you to pay attention to something. Look at their cash flow, look at their income. Remember the other rule that we do? We take cash flow times 12, right? 2,285. 10 times 12, 27,421.20. Oh, we got a seasoned client right there. She already gets it. Increase the HELOC. The HELOC. Just, 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 just. That is exactly one thing that we want to do. We want to uppity up our credit limit. Why, ladies and gentlemen? Our numbers have improved which means our debt tool needs to upgrade with the number so that we can continue to leverage accordingly. She's at a point now where the HELOC is very small in comparison to her income and cash flow, which can potentially lead us to violating the rule of 66%, right? That's a rule too. What, 
What rule allows me to violate the main rule? When your cash flow times 12 is more than 66% leverage, that's when we can chunk more than 66%. Does that make sense? So we're floating right here. New cash flow come January, February, 2022. Here's where we're at. A new cash flow. Haven't paid off any debt yet. We're right here. Velocity banking rule by Denzel says chunk 15 grand. Should I just go that low? You could. Can I be more efficient? Absolutely. Okay. So let's just look. Let's see. Okay. Um, we got 8,000. 947.77, all right, 8.99. We got that $10,000 credit card, 10679.11, 19,626.86, okay? So we'll write that right here, 19,626.88. Now, we know that those balances are gonna be a little bit less, right? Because 228 two times month of October, didn't even count September, October, November, December, January, say February, five months, 1140. Okay, so eight, nine, four, seven, 77 minus 1140, 7807, 77. Yeah, say add another $125 in interest. All right, probably more than that. Balance would probably be somewhere around 8,000 come February. And you would do the same thing with each of the debts, right? So I'm only gonna do it once more with that other credit card. Comment below if you agree, yeah, we should tackle the credit cards. Next, those two. And don't forget that little guy. It expires in six months. How long has it been over here? Four or five. So by March, if I'm not mistaken, March is when this card expires, if I'm not mistaken, right? So we wanna pay attention to that. Don't let that little guy fool you because we're no longer paying the monthly payment that she set, paying the monthly minimum payment required to reroute that cash flow to pay off debt a little faster on the HELOC itself, right? That's why we got it done faster. So by the time this thing expires, we get rid of that. So would you agree that the next chunk should be towards these three credit cards? I don't see the value in tacking the 401k loan. That's at 5.25. That's lower than 5.99, 8.99, and whatever that rate goes up to, it'll be higher. I don't see the value in tacking, tackling the highest uh, interest debt. The balance is too high. It's gonna take too long. It's gonna slow me down, right? Hits my momentum. I can get access to cash flow much faster from here, right? So I can potentially increase my cash flow by 216, 228, 50 bucks, $494. And then allow this payment to keep doing damage on this debt. You would agree that five months later, roughly, January, February, 2022, balance might be around 27 thousand 28,000 maybe right so it'll go down a couple thousand bucks let's make that next chunk increase cash flow the highest the fastest we're also saving money on what interest I move 8.99 to 3.25 5.99 to 3.25 and then whatever that rate would go up to down to 3.25 and then as you know borrowing costs will get offset so let's go off of the highest chunk likely to occur by January, February of 2022, just by adding the current numbers. But as you know, we're creating room for error. This is not actually going to be the case. 2,204.53, 8,947.77 10,679.11. 11. The highest chunk, if I did not increase the HELOC, which I would argue with this client, we should definitely um, apply for a credit limit increase. That should not be an issue. I don't think it would be a hard pull because this is revolving open-ended. So I don't think we would have to go through a whole new application process. Maybe, maybe not, but we're gonna get the details. We're gonna find out, okay? But let's say she didn't. The highest chunk would be 21,831.41. Pays off three credit cards. Uh, what was the cash flow gain? 494, 50 plus 228 plus 216. Okay, wonderful. We go from 494, add the 228510. New cash flow number. What are we looking at? 2,779.10. What's my new expense number? 7,411.74 minus what? 494. Expenses go down. 6,917.74. So now let's do the math. 
83141. I am way overestimating. It's not even fair, but we're still going to run it to see, does it make sense? And what would my borrowing cost be on that number? If this number ends up being good, can you imagine how much better the actual number is going to be? The actual chunk amount is probably going to be in the neighborhood of 18, maybe 19,000. The actual number to pay off those three cards four or five months from now. So let's just go off that 21,831,41. Do the same math times what? 3.25% divide by 365. We're doing this all over again. Ready? $1.94 is that borrowing cost minus income. 9,000, oops, 9,696, 84. That's income, expenses coming out, 6,917, 74. Guys are with me, comment below. This is good, Denzel, keep it going. If you got lost in the sauce, let us know. Someone in the comments will help you along the way so you don't get lost, okay? 21,831, 41, minus nine. 69684. That's the lowest. What? Highest 21. Lowest 12. 12134. That's what the balance goes down to when you minus income. Right? 12134. 5 sib times 3.25%. Divided by 365. 108. Liking this? Liking this? Comment below. Let me know. Denzel, I like it. Give me some more. Okay, I'll give you some more. 12,134, 57 plus expenses going out, 6,917, 74. Balance goes back up. Ending balance, February 2022, 19,000, 31. Balance, February 2022. Times 3.25%, five by 365, $1.69. Let's do the math. Add the three. Divide by three. Add the three, divide by three. A dollar and 57 cents a day, all right? Dollar 57 a day on average is my cost max chunk to wipe out those three debts. Times that by 30 days. What's my borrowing cost, ladies and gentlemen? $47.16 month one minus $35.15 on average. What's my borrowing cost class? $12.14. Hallelujah. That is based off $21,000. If you were to minus it, I bet you do the numbers minus, try to do the interest rates, right? You take 228 times that by four or five months, 216 times that by four or five months, uh, 50 bucks times that by four or five months, minus those balances off of these numbers right here. You're going to get a net actual chunk amount, right? I'm getting so excited. Hold on. 50 times four, right? It was 228, um, 216. That's like a couple thousand bucks off of 21. So we realistically, that actual chunk was probably gonna be $3,000 less, right? If 21,000 highest balance ends up averaging me uh, a net of $12 and a penny of interest, right? $12 and a penny, then I'm pretty sure that we could actually bring the borrowing costs to probably $40, $35, where this actually becomes like zero. Even if it did have borrowing costs, would you agree I still go faster than debt snowball making extra payments debt avalanche? Yes or no? Comment that. Let me know. <clears throat> so keep moving along. All right, let's keep going. All right, is this good? Is this good stuff? This is what it takes when you really look at your numbers. You're like, oh my God. All right, all right, I'm getting excited. This is a possibility. So she now chunked in somewhere June of 2021. We're in September 2021. We're bringing the chunk back down to zero by January, February of 2022 is what we projected. We're likely to make a chunk anywhere from as high as 21K as low as probably 18, right? which is a little over 66%, I'm okay with that, all right? Balance nets out around 19,000 at its highest. My borrowing cost was $12, major victory. We reroute 8.99, 5.99, whatever that interest rate would be, and we get a cash flow gain of 494. I solve for all three, okay? Now, 
What else can we do to enhance this strategy for my seasoned clients? Anything else you see that I can add to the equation? Let me look back up here. All right, so after she said increase the HELOC, Emily says I do the 8, 9, 47 next chunk, maybe stretch the rule, do the 10K card too. Yes, okay, yep, we went over that, cool. Possibly lower rate tool, maybe. She said increase mine to 50K, went from 6% to 3.75. In this case, I don't think her rate would um, go down because she already got the approval of that intro rate and now they increase it to 3.25. Not sure if they would give her a, a brand new intro rate again. That would be uh, pretty cool if that were the case. So Alex Chan says, what, you know, is with us, pay off the three cards, yep. Does the increase depend on the amount of equity you have? Absolutely, yeah. But understand, look how much uh, utilization debt we wipe out. The mortgage is at 305 currently. Five months from now, it's gonna be a little bit less. Value of the home might have gone up, but also there's, there's more equity than what's shown here. She's got a good amount of equity in her property that we can absolutely tap into, okay? Most are only lending 75% LTV credit units seem to be high as my okay? Is there a way to do velocity banking while I save? So what do you think we're doing here? Son sanadora, sanadora, ojo, pay attention. What do you think we're doing here? What do, what do you think happens when we consolidate debt? What, what is the term for consolidating debt to actually make you what? You save money. So you have to really analyze your numbers. Remember how I said earlier that this client has savings, has investments in other, look, we're not touching none of that. We're just touching the four major numbers here. That's all we're touching at the moment. While we're doing velocity banking, you are saving what? Monet, right? When you shift the debt, you're saving money on all these interest rates. That money is savings. You're running bills through a credit card. You're saving money. We're offsetting. So we're saving, absolutely. Just not traditionally saving the way you normally would. When a crisis occurs in your finances, where do I go? I now have four paid off credit cards that I can access. Possibly have 0% offers on purchases for the next 12 months. I've got a paid off HELOC. I've got space to use. Yes, the debt is lower. So I put myself in a very, very good position without touching their pre-existing savings, okay? So yes, we can absolutely do velocity banking while saving. Imagine if this person's numbers, right? Like they put 12,000, was their income nine grand, 3,000. Let's say this is you, son or daughter, right? Let's say this is you. And you say your cash flow is $3,200, but in your expenses, you put that you save $300 a month. That's how we, do our four major numbers is we include savings as an expense. That's money that goes away from velocity banking. So the 300 bucks, right? That could go over there. You could minus it off the income and then just do velocity banking off whatever numbers you want to work with. We could absolutely do that. It's a preference. In terms of efficiency, maximization of cash flow, it may not do you a lot of justice to move savings in a bank account that's not earning you anything when we could have technically your own bank account, savings bank account right here. Mind you, this is secure debt, this HELOC equity in her property. Yeah, she's getting charged this interest rate, but isn't she appreciating in the value of her home as she's making regular monthly mortgage payments? Don't you see the net gain by not saving in a separate account, putting the savings in the home to do what? Zero cost of borrowing. So we mentioned about what debts we're gonna tackle the chunk, but I, wanna, I wanted to challenge you guys to think on what are some other ways that we can enhance what we're doing here, right? So would you agree at this point in time, February, 2022, if I wipe out three utilization debt accounts, right, gone, my credit score should go up, should be more powerful. I could potentially request apply for a credit card zero percent on what purchases balance transfer right what would be a debt that remains it's just the mortgage 401k loan in this personal loan what would be a debt that you would want to leverage a zero percent credit card for say 12 months zero percent on balance transfers and 
0% balance transfer fee. So no cost of borrowing, zero cost of borrowing, zero, nada, zilch, nothing. What would be a debt that you guys would shift? How much, how little, right? Let's say we got um, approved for, I don't know, say 15 to 20K, very realistic. Again, use the same rule, 66% of the debt tool. Alex, love what you're saying. Monthly expenses paid annually. Absolutely, we could do that. Instead of paying off debt, we could potentially temporarily increase our cash flow by more than whatever the debt I'd be hitting. Now that is a strategy, my friend. Ishmael says the loan, absolutely. That would definitely be the loan I'd go after, 15.43%. You mean to tell me that I could use a 0% credit card, maybe get approved for in the neighborhood of 15 to 20K, use about maybe 10 to 13,000, right? 0%, 12 months, balance transfer, 0% fee, zero cost of borrowing. We could roughly wipe out almost 50% of the loan debt and put it over here for 12 months. It does not affect the payment. You still gotta pay the 1071, but the 1071 at that point is mostly principal you remove over 50% of the interest. That could be a wonderful move. Another move which Alex went over, Alex Chan said, you know, hey, move your monthly expenses, pay them up annually. I think that would be more valuable based on the leverage amount that I use. If I can get equal to cash flow gain of this debt, if I can do that, ladies and gentlemen, then let's say we went Alex's way and we use roughly 10, to 13k 13k if i got a proof of 20 10k if i got a proof of 15 so 10 to 13k zero cost and let's say the cash flow increase was roughly 750 bucks to about a thousand dollars right that's very possible when you switch from monthly to annual you'd be surprised how much money we can recoup this isn't permanent cash flow gain this is temporary cash flow gain for say 12 months that means i don't even touch that debt. i pay the monthly minimum payment on that debt's probably gonna be anywhere from 100 to 200 a month. So if you if you got a 750 cash flow gain, in reality, the net would be 650 or 550 cash flow gain. Does that make sense? Okay. Then you take that cash flow from paying all your bills up for the year of 2020, 2022, which would be perfect timing, ladies and gentlemen, because you're at the top of the year. Perfect timing, right? We're at the top of the year. I increase my cash flow immediately while simultaneously I made that chunk. So now I've got roughly an additional 550, 650 or more of cash flow to the HELOC. What does that do to the HELOC? <laughs> Makes my borrowing costs zero. I come out ahead. It also helps me pay off the HELOC faster, probably within four to six months. I got six months to spare over here. And then I can take those four, that last tail end of the 0%, four to six months, the last four to six months, I'll wipe out the loan. And now that's gone. Thousand bucks. Bum, 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 bum. HELOC's now at zero prior to the credit card hitting expiration date. We either use the HELOC to pay off the card in full, or by that time, you might very well just have the cash on hand to wipe out the card. Okay, so we could go Alex's route or we could go Ishmael's route where we remove 50% or more of the interest. The payment stays the same. So there isn't going to be a cash flow gain necessarily, but it certainly helps us bring this HELOC as we bring the HELOC back down to zero from the that following chunk in February of 2022. Helps us pay off this loan in one shot and gives us just enough time to come back to that 0% card, wipe that out, and now everything is done except for the 401k loan and the mortgage, okay? So let's keep it going. Let's say that from February 2022, and we'll go six months to be super conservative, but I can almost assure you she'll have it knocked out much faster, right? But let's go six months, and we'll start in the month of March. We'll count March not February, not the chunk month, right? We'll go, we'll go further just to create some distance. So one, two, three, four, five, August of 2022, HELOC hits zero, right? HELOC at zero, paid off. 
if we went Alex's route, we still have a balance on the card and we still owe money on the loan. And let's say we got approved for that credit card in the month of February or maybe a little after. So we know that by 2023 of February or March is when that card would expire. So if I'm in August of 2022 and I went Alex's route of running bills, we don't worry about paying off the card come August. He locks at zero. You chunk at the loan, pay the loan off. You now get a thousand bucks. You reroute 15.43% to 3.25, which is actually zero in our case, because we're not getting charged any interest whatsoever, right? And we do velocity banking up until what? Either by February when the card, when this card expires or before, done. If we went uh, Ishmael's route, we use a portion of the credit card, knocks down the loan, same thing by August, 2022, HELOCs at zero, in fact, we would actually go faster. Um, no, I'm, I'm sorry, that's a lie. We'll probably have it paid off around, probably a little after, I'm sorry. We would actually have this paid off a little, maybe a little after because we don't get the cash flow gain, we get the interest savings. So we don't really see that right away. So maybe we're in, uh, maybe it takes an extra month or two, if that, September, 2022, HELOCs at zero. Whatever the loan balance is, the remainder, we wipe it out with the HELOC, do velocity banking before the card expires, wipe it out, done. At that point in time, by at least February, March of 2023, the HELOC's at zero. The loan is paid off, all cards are paid off. The only thing left is the mortgage and the 401k loan. And at that point in time, being super conservative, February, March of 2023, either A, we continue to pay off debt as long as the rate does not exceed 3.75 or 5.25 it'll continue to make sense to do velocity banking to pay off the remaining mortgage and the 401k loan if the rate exceeds 3.75 percent then it's only going to make sense for a period of time not that much longer okay not that much longer. I left that comment on like crazy and that was probably in the way of you guys. I'm so sorry. Um, so we could potentially shift our strategy in February, March of 2023, where instead of paying off debt, she could look at her debt and says, well, this is costing me 5.25%, but the interest I'm paying myself, the interest on my money that's growing in the account. So there's a bit of a wash there. My mortgage is at a 3.75%. The value of the home is probably growing three to 4%, maybe higher than that. So there's a bit of a wash there. I can then make the argument to say by 2023 or sooner, instead of paying off debt, I can get a higher rate of return on money if I choose to what? Invest. Either invest in something outside of myself, in some type of asset class, I could go the IBC route, start a high cash value life insurance policy. That could be a route. Or I know with this particular client, they want to build a business. So we could go the 10X route where we could continue to increase our income. The what remains of debt is the mortgage and the 401k loan. And if they come to a conclusion where the debt is not killing them, it doesn't hurt them whatsoever, their cash flow is north of 3,000 or higher at that point, right? After paying off the loan, 32.85 plus 4.94. All right, so we're, we're like almost north of 4K cash flow, doing very well. At that point, I could say, well, I, I got $4,000 a month in cash flow. 4,000 times that by 12, $48,000 a year in free cash flow. What can I do? Can I? take my cash flow times 12 per year and earn higher than 5.25 and 3.75 added together more than 8.75 more than 9%. Can I do that? Do I have it in me to either start a business and profit more than 10% in that business and create more income? Do I have the ability to invest in the stock market in real estate in crypto and gold and silk and all these other different, you know, investment opportunities and earn a higher rate of return than what my debt is charging me 
to create arbitrage? I mean, at that point, would you agree that this, this couple, this family is, is very disciplined with their money at that point? We're talking 2023. They've got two, three years of Velocity Banking in the books, managing their finances. They've created a new culture of how they view money. Do you see the, the evolution, how that occurs, how things improve? the more they pay attention to the to the numbers and think of creative financial ways to produce more wealth, produce more income and leverage where we're not just borrowers, we're also lenders, right? Most of the time here, we're borrowing, but we're effective borrower in the 21st century. If I borrow at 0%, what is my loss? Nothing. So I'm actually gonna go faster than the guy that does not borrow because when he or she borrows, they pay interest. When Velocity Banking students borrow, we don't pay interest. If we do pay interest, it's minuscule compared to what? Our measurement stick, debt snowball, debt avalanche, created efficiency, right? Good stuff, you guys like it? How do you feel? Are you happy? Are you like, oh my God, that was a lot? Let me get your comments. Let me see how you guys are feeling so far. Rodney says apply for more debt weapons. We can absolutely do that, right? Um, it depends on their capacity to handle debt. Remember that. So everybody's different. Convenient checks. Yep. That was through the balance transfer. Yes, yes, yes. Um, let's see. So we got 63 people in the house now. Wonderful, wonderful. Lesson is complete. I'm done. We looked as far out to 2023 for this particular client, right? And we paid off in that time four credit cards that $31,000 loan, and then we left the 401k and the mortgage, right? Again, way overestimated. In reality, we could be very well in 2022, right? Of all debts paid, cleared out. We could very well be there. So if we add up the numbers of the amount of debt that gets wiped out during this timeline from September, 2021 to roughly December, 2022 we got that 12,618 that gets wiped out that was the original previous chunk on the HELOC we wipe out the 204 card the 894 7.77 the 10,679.11 and the 31,717.63 $66,000 over a roughly 13 to maybe 15 month period Right, so let's write that down. 66,167.82. Not to mention the 323.33 over a 15 month period. Now I understand a portion of this is interest, but it's still debt that she's tackling, is she not? It's still debt that she's tackling. And then the mortgage, 2000 to 2020 times say 15 months, another 33,003. Add them all up, 4,849.95 plus 66,167.82. Over $100,000 of debt, roughly 13, 15 month, maybe 17, 18 month period. With the starting cash flow working with 196010, going all the way up to roughly 4,000. 4,000 times, say, 18 months is only 72 grand, but we didn't have cash flow of four grand for those 15, 17, 18 months. It gradually increased. So do you, do you see the difference between 104 and 72? That's called leverage. That's called recapturing dollars, recapturing interest. So we're able to have our principal dollars work so much stronger in our favor, but the numbers have to make sense because not every time, 100% of the time, is this going to work. Not every time, we know that. When it does work, it works beautifully. It has to work beautifully or relatively nice looking, good looking, you know? Not okay, decent, like we, we really want to create acceleration. If we can't achieve that, and we're also not good with the concept, and we're not thinking of creative ways to improve our strategy, then it may not be the most efficient strategy. Therefore, bum, we stick to debt snowball, debt avalanche until you build the courage, the discipline, the attitude, the behaviors, the structure, the principles, the rules, the fundamentals, 
the studying to get to that point where you fill up my whiteboard. When you fill up my whiteboard, you're doing something right.